Okay, so welcome everyone. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. A uh, warm welcome to all attendees on this module on vessel performance monitoring, which is organized by the BS Group. My name is Apostolos Pulovasilis, and it's a great honor and pleasure for me to be moderating this excellent panel of experts today. And a big thank you to all the BS team for this initiative. Also, many thanks go to the sponsors of the event, which are NAPA, Siemens Marine Energy, and RENA. So let's begin by going through our agenda for today. I will start off uh, very soon myself with a short introduction uh, of our subject. Um, and then I will aim to address some of the key points which our speakers will be analyzing in more detail. Uh, so then when we look at the panel, uh, first of all, on the schedule, we have uh, Mr. Mark O'Neill from Columbia Ship Management, who will be addressing the performance management for large fleets customer driven approach. Uh, I must say that Mark hasn't joined us yet, so we may have to shuffle the, the, the schedule somewhat, uh, but I will let you know uh, any, anyhow. Um, after Mark's presentation, we have a dedicated Q&A slot uh, with Mark for another five minutes. Um, second on the schedule is uh, Mr. Ossi Metala from Napa, who will be addressing from data to KPIs. Then be Mr. Patrick Mueller from Siemens Marine Energy, who will be talking about the digital marine solutions and services, and how could digitalization help to fulfill sustainability targets. After Patrick's presentation, we will also have a Q&A slot, uh, which is dedicated for, for him for five minutes. Uh, then we'll go on to Ms. Michaela Shinona from RENA, who will be talking about asset monitoring to boost efficiency, a step towards decarbonization. And last but not least, for sure, is the Tor Oyvind Ask from Solvang ASA, who will be discussing the vessel performance monitoring and the key to green shipping. And after the end of all the, the panel presentations, you will have the opportunity through the uh, dedicated Q&A slot uh, for another half hour to pose any further questions uh, to all or to any of the panel members. So some administrative arrangements, as you can see in your platform, you have the option of posing written questions to the panelists via the Q&A tabs. And as I said, there are two opportunities for this. Some of the speakers, which I mentioned, have opted to have the dedicated Q&A slot immediately after the end of their presentations. Uh, and others will wait for the end of all the presentations. And as I said, we can take all those questions together during that final Q&A session. So I'm hoping for a very interesting event. Uh, I, I encourage as much participation from the audience as possible. Uh, the presenters can also respond in writing to any of the, uh, the, the questions, but we will also have a discussion of some of the uh, more pertinent questions, uh, as I said, during those slots that we have uh, already determined. So just to put everything in, in context, I would say, uh, we all recognize that digitalization uh, as a, is, is progressing. Now, in this, I would say, nearly post-pandemic world, hopefully, uh, and with the, the successful rollout of vaccines, uh, vaccine programs throughout the world, uh, I would say that one of the few positive aspects that we have that has emerged and possibly been forced upon us is the acceleration of the transition towards the digitalization. Uh, and we're seeing that definitely automation and systems are speeding up in the maritime industry. Now, I can say that digital technologies and solutions, they're increasingly being used uh, to boost competitiveness, I would say, uh, but also enhance operational efficiency. They are also being implemented, or should be implemented, to drive our industry along the decarbonization path in order to achieve zero emissions from international shipping by mid-century. Now, data streams from sensors or other sources of information that can be used for decision-making and enhanced monitoring, control, quality assurance and verification activities. In the maritime industry, we're seeing an increase in the use of sensor technology, which allows the vast amounts of data to be collected from vessels. Uh, and through the use of advanced analytics, this allows the shipboard and shoreside personnel to more effect effectively manage the ship's functions. Now, 
various claims of improved efficiency and reduction of costs through cuts in fuel consumption, they have to be very carefully analyzed, but they need accurate data provided by reliable sensors. We know that data is growing and, and why it's expected to grow. The first relates to the rapid exp expansion of the area which is loosely termed big data. And this includes the use of large data sets to support machine learning and artificial intelligence applications. The second is the growing use of systems where data is the lifeblood that connects together disparate elements and allows cohesive capabilities to be built. But in order to secure efficient, sustainable operations and strengthen short and long-term competitiveness, all the maritime stakeholders, they need to rethink current strategies and adapt. So today we're going to be covering a number of elements that need to be considered during such a strategy phase. These include people analytics, focusing on management, resources and capabilities, integrated systems, tools and connectivity, technology, efficient solutions, as well as energy efficient and enhanced performance monitoring, just to name a few. Now, the maritime industry is a truly global industry and absolutely the ideal sector in order to apply digitalization solutions, simply because of the nature of the business, which entails several remote units, the vessels, generating large amount of varied data from a wide range of sources and different formats. So although both decarbonization and digitalization are considered by many as being disruptive, I do believe they can bring opportunity. However, there are some challenges. For example, I have seen many companies developing solutions and then going to try and find the problem. Instead of truly defining the problem they want to solve first, and then aiming to create a solution. There are also a high number of ship operators that are still using customized solutions which are not fully integrated and based on technology, perhaps supported by their own IT departments, which make them cost ineffective and difficult to maintain. I've also seen some companies that have inevitably applied very fragmented approaches to performance monitoring, which has led to a jigsaw puzzle of solutions that don't do what they said they would do. Subsequently, there is a risk, risk of losing trust uh, in these technology promises and more specifically digital solutions. And therefore we must reiterate the importance of a collective effort to resolve future challenges. I truly believe that the biggest challenge of all is the integration of all the various applications and systems, ensuring data quality, as well as of course, security of the data itself. So we need to move away from the silos that we have on board many ships and companies today. And by aggregating fragmented data sources and using analytics, companies can have access to integrated data that has the potential to reduce their overall operation expenditures and maintain their individual competitive advantage in the market. Therefore, we need to pursue models which are capable of integrating multiple data sources including environmental, the sensors and control systems to aggregate, assess and ultimately predict the overall performance of a vessel, its propulsion and hull interaction. This adds the benefits of remote and re near, near real-time monitoring capability that many of us have come to recognize and appreciate more during the pandemic without putting extra burden though on the ship's crew who are the true heroes of global seaborne transportation. So let us not forget the people skills and the competencies which are required to process and analyze all this data. Even if the right automation framework has been defined, a company will still need to manage the people skills necessary for operation, measurement, collection, and processing tasks so that the outputs can be monitored and reported according to the company's review process and all the available data exploited. Otherwise, why bother collecting it in the first place? So finally, some key success factors which we have observed in this respect are the development and application of fundamental knowledge and skills in the shipping intelligence and business data analytics, the review of the different types of data available and generated from ships from various sources in both analog and digital formats. The determination of correlations between different parameters, and therefore increasing the 
interdependencies and integration between essential components of a vessel's machinery, equipment, and systems, and the analysis of real-time data streams from within a normal ship management operation, looking for patterns, an early hint of problems, uh, as well as identifying trends and unearthing valuable insights to make sense of the data and use it ultimately to improve decision making. So without any further ado, I, I would suggest that we go to our panel and see some of these features that I've mentioned, uh, maybe discuss the advantages of collecting and having access to the right data, as well as the, the performance indicators necessary that can inform and prompt uh, effective decision making in order to help us understand what is happening at the moment, as well as some of the trends for the future. So, since I think Mark uh, is having some technical difficulties, Mark, are you with us? Are you able to join? I am, I am with you. Thank you very much. I was having some technical I would, uh, if you're ready, we can start with yourself uh, and I will introduce you uh, right away. So Mark O'Neill is president of Columbia Ship Management, uh, a maritime lawyer by profession. Mark was a partner with Stevenson Howard LLP and retired LLP for 17 years and headed up their German shipping team and also co-led the firm's offshore department. Mark has an in-depth knowledge of the shipping, ship management, banking and offshore sectors, uh, chairing and speaking at numerous events such as this one. Uh, and he's a passionate advocate, as I am, of performance optimization, digitalization, crew training, and the human element within the shipping and ship management industry, uh, which is something which we are looking forward to hearing about, Mark. So when you're ready, over to you. I think we're having some technical problem with Mark's microphone. I think uh, maybe you can have a few minutes to try and sort this out, Mark, and uh, while you're doing that, maybe we can go on to the next presentation and then come back to you when, when you're ready, uh, I would suggest. Okay, so we're going to start then with Ossi Metala from Napa, from Data to KPIs. Ossi is the Customer Success Manager at Napa. Uh, with over 10 years experience in our industry. Uh, with naval architecture background, he's been working with ship design and many novel machine, machinery solutions. The focal point has always been R&D and energy efficiency, including ship system simulations, onboard audits, training, and consultation. Uh, and whether it's been about ship design or operation, OSI has always been involved in pushing industry di digitalization forward. So looking forward to hearing from that, uh, about that from OSI, over to you. Thank you, Apostolos, and your opening was very important and inspiring and very important topics covered there by first defining the problem before providing the solution and thus also breaking the silos from the data barriers. And that's actually some of the topics that I am going to discuss with you today. Um, let me know once you can see my screen, but I'll get started. Um, so thank you for having me. So I'll take my 15 minutes to talk to you about the, the process from the data, the digital data, the analog data, and how to turn that into the KPIs, the performance indicators, and how to even take a step forward from there, turn the indicators into the results, and then back again. Uh, so first, for a few words about myself. My name is Ossi Mettel. I'm by Education Naval Architect, and I've been working for NAPA shipping solutions since last April. And Napa as a company has a very long history, 30 years in fact, on providing digital data-led solutions for safety, efficiency, and productivity in both ship design and operations. And within those 30 years, we have established 10 offices across the world, uh, many located in the major shipbuilding and shipping hubs. Uh, and we are very proud on the fact that 95% of the new builds designed and built and early are built 
by Napa clients, and we are pushing closer to the 200 employees globally. And we have over 12,000 uh, active users on Napa applications across all entities that we're having from ship design to safety to shipping solutions. But let's start by first touching the topic that actually that was also included in the opening speech is that starting point should be always the purpose definition and challenge defi definition and then combining the desired outcome with the right data coming from on board, coming from other so, uh, data sources, digital analog analogical, and then creating the KPIs and turning those into actions. Because after all, the KPIs, the performance indicators, are only mere a intermediate step from the data to the results. And this whole loop should be iterative, continuous process of monitoring the data, following the KPIs, taking actions, checking the results, and then again, iterating the process. So the starting point must and should be is designing, uh, defining the purpose. So what is actually where we are heading with the data because the inherent value of the data itself is very low. The KPI is the value, the tool to create the value from the data itself. So define this purpose and then understand the scope and what you are heading towards it. So the purpose can be any way from ecological, just pure reducing the CO2 emissions, financial, getting more higher ROI for your investments, getting more from your vessel, or just play regulatory. So reporting EEOIs for the side is also a good purpose for this. So once you have to define the day that you know we're heading towards, then it's start, time to start designing the intermediate step to define the KPI. So what is the best indicator for my desired outcome? What can I, what can I do with the data that I have? Should I combine the data with different sources? What are the challenges there? How can I approach this challenge? Um, and then finally, plan and execute the improvement. So to take the value from the data, you need the KPI, you need the, ax the actions, and then benchmark the results against the K KPI, iterate and retain the continuous improvement. Uh, but one important thing here to note is that the, the KPI must not be the target itself, it's just mere an intermediate step. So it will cease to be a good measure if the target Become, if the measure becomes a target itself. Uh, about the data sources uh, and all that, as we already learned, the connectivity, the breaking the silos in between the data sources and systems and the shared information, that is the key for successful digitalization, successful data gathering, KPIs and generation. I'm taking here an example from, from Napa, of course, and the uh, you know, in our concept, there, everything should be in, in cloud, cloud-based, which enables many brilliant uh, solutions. So first, it is accessible by all users, from the ship, from ship, ship side to onshore operators, as well as charters and other, other third-party uh, parties. In, in addition, we can, you can combine not only digital data or analog data, but you can combine the um, substance knowledge, substance information with that for hydrodynamical models and all that to create the truly uh, a, a strong platform for continuous improvement, continuous monitoring. And as we are also learned is that connectivity between the systems also is important. So there are a lot of um, good solutions coming up in the future about the how connect the different solution providers, how the interfaces between these the systems should be arranged and, and all that. So the future is looking very good for the maritime industry in front when it comes to digitalization especially. But also about the KPIs, you can also think on how to categorize these in the maritime context. So they can be like purely technical looking the vessel as technical unit. How it behaves, how how it behaves, how energy efficient it is. 
So EEDI, EEXI, pure technical measurements or how the fouling, what's the impact on that? And other, maybe more classical meaning, equipment failure rate or fuel to work ratios and all that. But also the operational side. So how the vessel is, how it's op operated, what is the, the impact on the decisions made by the masters, made by the operators? Energy operational index, EEOI is one of the new ones. And that's basically these currently hot topics, AER and CII. We are, of course, looking very keenly what is happening on the MEP C76 meeting quite soon. So those are interesting new operational indexes for that. Uh, from, but then the other way around is just pure commercial a KPI, so daily rate and time charter equivalence and monitoring those. So what is the uh, axle availability of the vessel combined to the design availability throughout the year and all total transportation work time? So just to show that there are a lot of different ways to measure and, and benchmark your vessels, your operation, your financial side, but uh, just understanding where this is coming from, what kind of data is used for those, and what is the desired outcome is the key here. But let's take a look at the uh, closer look at some of the KPIs here. So naturally, we cannot cover them all, but the, let's look at those and especially their challenges that might be associated with them. Because naturally, no KPI is perfect alone. So as was mentioned, you must know what kind of data you're using, what is the inherent limitations of that data, what are you doing with the KPI and where it can take you. So for example, EEDI and EEXI, which I'm sure is very well, which you're aware, of, which you're well aware, is that those are just standardized technical benchmarks from from one operational point from the vessel. So they don't reveal the true operational range or the power range from these vessels. Um, they don't take into account the true operational conditions or true transportation work done by these vessels. So it doesn't matter if the how well the vessel is maintained, how skillful is, are the masters or the routers, operators, those do not take that into account. Yes, very successful compromises from IMO for the purpose, but they do have their limits too. Or carbon, carbon intensity indicator, which gives a grade for the vessel based on the CO2 emissions, capacity and distances. But um, again, that doesn't use the true transportation work done rather than just the capacity. And like many others, we're looking here for, for the CO2 emissions alone. What about the other greenhouse gas emissions or the, or the ballast water treatment system failures or what, what's the impact on the marine life on that? So some hard challenges there too. And on the bigger picture, many KPIs are challenging to or hard to scale to other vessels. So even though the, there might be sister vessels, but down anyway, these are more or less prototype vessels and each vessel is individual, having the individual challenges and benefits and performance levels. So how to scale the KPIs, how to isolate the meaning from parameters from the noise. So because these vessels anyway operate in a multi-domain environment with weather and all that impacting. So how to isolate the values. Um, but all in all, all the data, doesn't even have to come from the vessels. So data can be used, what is coming from the automation systems or noon data, but there are also alternative. What is, what is meaningful is how do we join the data and how we combine it with that with the substance knowledge from this. Taking a few examples here, so operational efficiency, uh, where we can consider, well, on this example, we were, we were looking at the cross-Atlantic voyages from after max size tankers from two years, from two years. And we compare their true voyages with the, um, with the most optimal ways of op op operating between port to port. And combining these two values, uh, we, could, we can create a performance indicator for operational efficiency. And in average for these voyages, we created the, uh, operational efficiency to be 84%, where the 100% is, would be the perfect op operation where the opti optimal alternative was met. Um, but here also there are, challenge there are many challenges that we had to con we considered was that 
okay, these vessels are individual, so you have to be, uh, basically you remove the vessel's specific technical characteristics from, from the equation so that you can create fair to fair apple to apples comparison between the vessel to vessel and the voyage to voyage. So the vessel specific technical uh, characteristic had to be considered and removed so that the operational decisions only have impact for the KPI. Or just looking at the vessel, not from the operational side, but from the as a technical unit side. So making analysis, you have to exclude, making technical analysis, you have to exclude environmental data from, from the equation. So meaning that what is the, even with the constant speed fuel consumption changes, which commonly can be coming from the weather impact or from other in, like technical details. So isolating the systems is possible. Once you have the correct data, you're combining with, with external sources, in this case, AIS and weather sources, and looking it from the, from the vessel specific level so that you can understand, okay, what is the expected level for this vessel? What is the hull fouling cost from there? And, and thus doing successful generalizations um, and by doing all this, it is possible to understand, okay, what is the hollow fouling level for this, for this vessel? When is thus creating actions for the operators or the owners to plan, for example, dry dockings or underwater hull cleaning. So there are different ways to, to look into the problem, a technical way or operational way, and then understanding what are the parameters affecting what should I exclude, exclude from the calculations so that we can get fair KPIs? And of course, we find a word about the NAPAS approach to make sense from all this big data. Um, we trust in connectivity in here. We trust on using the sustained knowledge on the big data sources and combining all that. And with NAPA fleet intelligence, we have voyage reporting, voyage monitoring. So look at the looking at the voyages from from operational point of view. What were the speed? What were the EOI indexes that we got, got for those voyages and all that? But then looking at those vessels from technical perspective, what is the hull founding level on there? What is the performance level of those vessels today? And naturally, the charter party compliance, creating charter party reports and evaluating the performance level against the warranty levels specified in the charter party agreements. And finally, of course, to bring the, uh, to turn the KPIs into actions are the voyage optimizations tools. So knowing the vessels, technically we can generate the most optimal way also to operate the vessel from port to port. And thank you for this. Uh, I think I've spent my 50 minutes and I'll happily take more questions through the chat and at, at the, in the end. Thank you very much. But we have to move on uh, with our next uh, presenter. So, uh, Mr. Patrick Muller, uh, who's the bus business owner of digitalization for Siemens Energy Marine. He started his career at Siemens in 1990 with a professional education as a power electronics installer. From 1998 until 2000, he was in charge of uh, Simatic, Siemens POC system, as an IT expert and technician, setting to work in service switchboards and power management. And later on, he became a product developer for power management and IT solutions. From 2012 to 2018, Patrick is a senior key expert and product manager for SeaShip and Sea Navy Automation Solutions for Siemens Marine Worldwide. And since 2018, Patrick is responsible as a business owner for the digitalization for Siemens Marine. So, Patrick, over to you, and uh, hopefully we can talk, learn more about digitalization, helping to fulfill sustainability targets. Yes, I hope so as well. Uh, as well, warm welcome from my end. Uh, I hope you can hear me and see me and see my screen. Fantastic, yeah. Fantastic. perfect. So technology is working and uh, digitalization and IT is sometimes magic things. 
Yeah, uh, what I would like to explain and introduce a little bit how does uh, we approaching as uh, uh, Siemens Energy uh, together with a partner company called Atos, uh, the problem or uh, the, the field of digitalization, especially for uh, the marine industry. So in the end of the day, I fully agree with uh, uh, Ozi was explaining uh, before me. Uh, so data is uh, uh, the, the future of magic, but uh, creating sense out of the data, that's uh, more or less uh, uh, what, uh, what is the key to be successful and to generate at least outcome. So digitalization for us is not uh, uh, to say uh, we have to sell it without uh, sense. Uh, what was in the, in the initial speech as well mentioned, the, it, you cannot develop something uh, to solve a problem which is unknown. Uh, so we would like to do it vice versa. First understood the client, understood the problem and then create a solution out of his problem. So what we did, uh, Whoops! I have to... Now it's going forward. So what we did is, uh, since I think uh, uh, up to ten years, uh, we're starting uh, to create a system, which on one hand uh, collect information, data points uh, from a vessel. A vessel is a huge ecosystem. Uh, in this ecosystem, a lot of uh, uh, essential control systems like propulsion system, power management system, navigation systems are installed. And all these uh, systems has a lot of sensor data inside. And what we are doing, we are uh, collecting all this information in an onboard database, uh, store them there historical can be uh, uh, up to one, two, three years, depends on what the client is really needed. On top of this uh, uh, database, we're providing uh, uh, the so-called application layer. Such applications, I'll give you later a detailed example out of that, uh, could be to visualize pure the data which we are collecting or make out of the data any sense uh, for, for the client by easy formulas, which presenting or calculating new values, EEDI or EEOI is, is such a, a, a field for us uh, where we're using, okay, that's an, a known formula. We have to feed the data in, in and then the outcome is in the end of the day, the EEOI. Or uh, we are also uh, using the modern data science technology to looking deeper into the data, to analyze data, to find correlation, which is not with human eyes in the first hand visible and to deliver there as well uh, tangible outcomes for 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 the client to be sustainable to meet the co2 targets uh, to save fuel at the end of the day to save money and uh, to make sense out of all these uh, uh, information which are still there on board on the vessel. So we do not have to generate new sensors or new data. We can use the first hand what we have. Then for sure we communicate information to to a cloud side. Uh, not all. I have a question in the chat. We cannot con uh, uh, communicate all information from a vessel to the cloud. Uh, that's impossible with the satellite communication links uh, we have to live with. But uh, we can uh, communicate KPIs, a smaller a couple of information to the cloud side, enrich them with external data sources like weather forecasting, uh, harbor logistic information, other information from other vessels in the fleet, and uh, enrich this data and come up as well there with any vessel performance information. Uh, interesting uh, uh, highlights uh, which the fleet operator typical wise need and for sure we can use as well the same platform to communicate for example weather data backwards to the vessel to use it there on board uh, to make uh, sense there okay now i come to concrete uh, uh, problems challenges solution benefits that's always uh, if we're starting to develop something or to co-create something uh, with a client 
we always are uh, starting with the challenge what is the problem what could be the solution and what is in the end of the day the outcome uh, for the client for that the challenge uh, one challenge is and I, I think I explained this uh, on the single line uh, uh, already the challenge is that we have a lot of immense amount of data available but we typically voice don't use it so uh, uh, a crew is not keen to use uh, power management information with navigation information so and uh, what we see is if we capture or what we're providing as a solution we capture the data in one common database uh, that they, you have one central point for visualization and uh, you make the data as well available uh, in the headquarter benefits pure easy to understand transparency comparable and the fleet management is able to optimize as well on shore I show here some some screenshots of our solution uh, so as, as well uh, for us key success is easy front end easy for uh, to understand so the typical operator of uh, such a system on board on the vessel is not uh, 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 keen to analyze the data with uh, uh, complicated tool we would like to have an easy understandable format uh, to understood what is uh, uh, in, uh, in this data and what he should do at the end of the day we see and analyze that that alone the transparency deliver us uh, I converted uh, uh, the saving in, T in CO2 emissions approximately 2% CO2 emission compared as, as well fuel consumption in the end of the day 2% uh, operational costs for for the your fuel costs just alone without any magic doing uh, uh, with data is just to make data visible and uh, make with easy tools possible to analyze their situation what they have on board or for the fleet operators that they are con can compare the, uh, their uh, different vessels but that's uh, not delivering really uh, that you have all uh, have to have always clever people so, uh, which analyze the data in your company so and here's one example what we are uh, doing um, an application called uh, auxiliary engine application uh, so the challenge is um, the auxiliary engine are producing the electrical energy on board on the vessel the challenge is the e efficiency uh by of using the energy or producing the energy uh, and the uh, maintenance cost so what we are doing we are doing with the so-called uh, data science approach we're using uh, a massive amount of data to detect uh, per engine the real SFOC curve like here and to analyze the key performance per kilometer, uh, indicator per engine and uh, uh, detect okay what is the right combination in your power plant to to uh, produce your engine which engine should have which load and uh, which engine is the most efficient engine so that you are able uh, to choose the right set of engine you can see uh, with easy visualization uh, what is uh, the, the actual efficiency of the engine and as well you can see here a uh, key performance indicator uh, which uh, guide you into the direction where your efficiency losses will be happened as well I put here some some figures on the table uh, we see and this we see from from really from project more or less three percent co2 emission or fuel saving possible in the end of the day with such an application um, I show up here uh, uh, this uh, as well on this slide we analyze this on a container vessel uh, where there we have a data capture uh, used for one year we optimized uh, the specific fuel oil consumption and uh, the real outcome of this analysis and uh, of this potential is 3.64% of fuel saving. 
And that's uh, done with real data, with a real vessel. And uh, if, if you ask me, yes, that's, that's the potential I see here for this application. I convert this as well for other uh, containers. I just use uh, Wikipedia. Uh, I calculate for for uh, another uh, container vessel class uh, uh, this saving potential. I took out what I found in Wikipedia for effect and assumptions. Uh, so how many auxiliary engines they have on board? What is the load and average sailing days? comes up with uh, uh, energy, uh, uh, amount of energy used per year. And if I calculate out of that backwards how many savings is possible with just with this only solution is uh, then uh, per vessel 20, uh, 20, 227 tons of fuel and in the end of the day converting this uh, to, to CO2, you see uh, approximately 800 tons of CO2 saving is there possible. And in the future, CO2 uh, is also something which is adding cost and saving CO2. Is, uh, in the end of the day, a sustainable target for me. One major question always comes up, okay, you, you explain me a lot what is possible, you show me this on other uh, uh, projects, uh, you have references, etc., etc. But how to make a a real contract out of that. The typical wise uh, to go forward here is uh, uh, that we are providing a pilot phase. Just on one vessel, we roll out this solution. Each party cover their own costs. So we are covering our costs, our partner covers his costs, the client has to be uh, cover his costs, and then we define the pilot phase, we define uh, KPIs, a timeline, and in the end of the day, after a quality gate, without any payment until here for the client, if the KPIs are fulfilled, then we are going into the delivery phase with a fixed pricing model, with a fixed rollout time, and with a fixed amount of vessels we would like to install. And this we do then on a performance-based contracting from the savings I show up here before, we would like to get amount of XYZ percent as uh, uh, payment uh, backwards uh, uh, from the client. So the client is always saving something. He do not have to pay in advance uh, or get any investment or risk on his side. Okay, and I think, I hope I'll be in my 10 minutes and open now for questions. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Patrick. Welcome. Uh, you're well inside your, your time, so that's great. Um, I see some of the questions coming in are, are more general. We can take maybe those at the end. Uh, also, I see some of you are already answering, but maybe specifically uh, for what you've just covered, uh, maybe you, we can answer, say, a question. Uh, for example, how long did Siemens Energy need to implement this uh, solution on board? A vessel, how long does it take, uh, and how would you implement the the cloud-based uh, fleet management system? Yeah, so uh, for installation on board, as we are not installing uh, huge sensor systems, uh, um, etc., we just uh, uh, come up with uh, with our IT equipment, uh, interfacing them to to the onboard system. For sure, some cables have to be run, but this is a, a small IT cables in the end of the day. Uh, so we are around uh, four to four weeks to two months uh, for an installation and keeps the system up and running, collecting the first data, and then we got uh, uh, the next step of the project to make sense out of the data uh, that we uh, then customize the application uh, to to the situation on board train the application with the uh, with the data we are already captured in the first phase and then uh, we uh, run out uh, the applications after i think as well one more or two months so in total for installation one to two months in first application, additional uh, two months. The cloud system is also available with uh, with the first installation, so that you can see your data. So 
one to two months for data and capturing and then second months uh, for providing the first applications. And uh, let me just follow up on that, uh, Patrick. We, yeah. I mean, what we see in practice, uh, and, and I, ha I have faced this myself with some of the older ships, uh, we have a lot of different uh, sensors of existing, some uh, producing analog signals, others digital. Uh, how is that tackled by, by your, your solution? Um, and again, does that add to your time, let's say, to, to put the, the solution in place? Oh, yeah, okay, the first uh, uh, point is, okay, uh, if you have an analog sensor, uh, it's hard to, to, to digitalize them, uh, but as well there we have uh, uh, already done this, uh, for example, for analog fuel meters, we have IoT devices uh, which are able to detect the, the analog value, which is shown on the display, in the end of the day, uh, it's an IoT camera in front of uh, uh, the fuel meter, which is reading uh, uh, the value. And the accuracy is uh, completely at 100%, so we really can detect what uh, the, the, the uh, analog value is, sh is uh, showing. And then uh, it uh, will be transferred to our system. So therefore, we can use as well all the sensors to integrate it uh, uh, into our system. And that's normal uh, normal situation. Uh, most of the vessels are older vessels. Uh, we cannot await that everything is already for digitalization for us. So, so therefore, we are looking uh, for for such uh, solutions. And we yeah, have exactly. such solutions in, in what place. I said right. we're, we're quite fragmented already. I mean, the, the existing ships and you know even new buildings. To be honest, some that we've seen delivered over the last few years, they they also have quite fragmented. Uh, Information. So, you know, I think we need, we need that time uh, to implement. Um, and then just one other question regarding your adaptive digital environment. What do you mean by that exactly? Yeah, adaptive means uh, that we are open, uh, open in, uh, into the direction of, uh, of the field area. So we are not uh, only limited to Siemens uh, uh, automation systems. So we can collect information from each system we found. So we have a huge library uh, with different drivers uh, to, to do so. Drill down to a uh, small camera which is detecting analog values. So open to collect every information which is available and uh, essential to do so. And adaptive uh, on the application uh, level, we know that we are for sure, it's not arrogant. We are Siemens, we are good, <laughs> but we are not uh, the only one. Uh, so I think uh, 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 Napa is also a clever company with clever solutions. So, and we see as well, uh, why not putting applications from third party on top of, uh, of an adaptive environment to enrich the platform and to deliver uh, uh, the best outcome to the client and not thinking in silos. Like, I like always the explanation, like your iPhone. Most of all applications on your iPhone are not from Apple anymore. And that's, uh, in the end of the day, our thinking. Hopefully, in a couple of years, most of the application on our platform comes not anymore from Siemens. Good, good. Okay, so I think that answers also one of the questions from the audience, from Roberto Santoro, that you have interfaces, you have integration with other systems, uh, and hopefully that is the way to go. I agree with you. Uh, I wish it can become so simple as, as for any, let's say, smartphone. Uh, okay, I think we can take more questions at the end, uh, because probably sure. we've, we've reached the end of that five-minute slot. Thank you again, uh, Patrick. Welcome. And uh, I think we can move on with uh, to Michaela and Shinone from Rina. Uh, Michaela Shinona, she's the Marine Digital Solutions Manager for Marina, and she obtained her master's degree as a naval architect uh, and marine engineer from the University of Genoa in 2014. She then joined Rina as part of the Marine Digital and Innovation Team, dealing with data analysis, CFD simulations, fleet performance management, and development of other software solutions like uh, electronic logbooks. So, looking forward to the application of this uh, this experience, uh, Michaela, to your presentation. She's currently the Marine Digital Solutions Manager for Rina. 
uh, and coordinates other software development teams as well. So over to you, Michaela. Hello, thank you. Um, can you hear me and can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, okay. perfect. Okay, thank you. Okay, so with my presentation, I'm actually going to show, try to show how the digital systems could help in achieving the, the targets that have been set by AMO. So as we all know, we actually have an important decarbonization strategy going on. And the final target would be to reduce the GHG emissions from international shipping by at least 50% by uh, 2050, compared to the ones that we had in 2008. So the main pillars that could help us achieve this decarbonization are, of course, the new fuels, which is a very hot topic at the moment. So fuels with zero C or zero Z equivalent. But on the other hand, fuels cannot uh, cope all the requirements or are not enough the new fuels. We also have to focus on the new technological improvements. So to improve the efficiency, in particular, of the existing ships and of the new buildings, and of course, to implement new operational measures that are actually optimized. Because for example, with relation to the new fuels, uh, bunkering habits may change because this, the new fuels may lead to new uh, shipping details, to new design of the ships. So the operational measures will need to be optimized and on existing ships, of course, optimizing the operational measures uh, will ensure to uh, operate the ships in the most efficient way. So fleet performance monitoring and uh, uh, digitalization will help to monitoring the efficiency of the fleet, proving the efficiency gains that have, is achieved are achieved through the technological improvements, and actually ensuring the comp will help ensuring the compliance over time with the new upcoming regulations. So as uh, previous presenter said, of course, we have the two important uh, indicators on the existing fleet, the technical and the operational one. So we are talking about EXI and CII. In terms of CEXI, we are in the, let's say, calculation part. But what happens if the required value is actually not met when we do the first calculation? So we must think about uh, solutions in order to meet the XI. And to, for this reason, it is very important to know the operational profile of a ship, to analyze it in order to verify the potential impact of the, for example, an engine power limitation or other interventions that may be done in order to achieve the XI. On the other hand, once the technical solutions or limitations are in place, it's important to ensure that the ship will remain compliant with the CII and the new CII reductions. So it's important to monitor the efficiency of a ship and to optimize the voyage of the vessel in order to even increase the uh, compliance. So systems like Optimum give the opportunity to uh, follow the ship over time and with the modular solution that we have development developed is actually possible to ease the fleet performance management and the optimization. And this will help to monitor over time and to overcome the upcoming decarbonization challenges. In particular, we have three main topics on which the system is focused on. So we have the monitoring, the live monitoring of KPIs or uh, different systems on board, such as scrubbers, for example, and the alerts generation in order to really quickly understand if the ship is behaving in the most efficient way or not and to get promptly alerted and have the opportunity to intervent. On the other hand, of course, we are collecting a lot of data and it's important to use in a good way this data. So we need to have an easy tool to analyze the information that we collect and to really understand the benefits of, for example, retrofitting actions or the best moment where the hull needs to be clean, for example. So to understand when the ship is actually not efficient, efficient enough and act uh, with this regard. On the other hand, there is a 
strong optimization, optimization core in the system that helps to optimize the trim and the voyage. And on the other end, also to benchmark the performance of a ship over time with targets that can be built within the system itself. So all these pillars help to achieve and to monitor the compliance with the regulations over time. So what is the system based on very briefly? Of course, we have a data collector on board which interfaces with the different systems, so navigation, automation, sensors, uh, scrubbers, and so on. This data is then enriched with external information, such as weather information or manual inputs, because of course, we cannot rely on some on the sensors for some specific information, because for example, I'm thinking about draft meters that may lead to important errors and we may need an intervention from the crew. With this data, we can actually build the dynamic model of the ship. We can build efficiency targets and monitor in real time the efficiency. And on the other hand, as we said with the analytics, we can actually plan the best moment to do a dry dock analyze an intervention, or assess and understand the EOI and CII status of the ship. So from the monitoring part, of course, having a view like this with the map with different colors based on the KPIs that we want to see, for example, we can have the CII class, the CII rank, or the comparison between the target power and the actual power, give opportunity to really easily understand the efficiency status of the fleet. On the other hand, going to the particular ship, uh, the possibility to set up, to build hydrodynamic set targets inside the system uh, gives the opportunity to continuously benchmark the, for example, the power of the ship or the thermodynamic efficiency with the SFOC or the consumption. So we have the opportunity to to take a snapshot of a ship in good conditions, so for example, after a dry dock, and compare it over time with the actual conditions of the ship. So this helps to understand if the ship is still efficient, if something occurred, and again, to act promptly in order to go back to the most efficient situation and uh, not have problems with the CII and the other indicators. On the analysis, point of view, what I'm showing now, it's an easy tool, but it's integrated inside the system and it's based on RENA experience as a first third party in certifying the gains after interventions. And here we have a before after situation. The ship in this case has changed the propeller. We had reblading and it's really quick and easy with the filters and with the period comparison to analyze the gains and to certify the gain that the reflecting action has had, because of course the maker can uh, grant a certain uh, gain, but until you measure it, you're not sure that that is real. So here we see the analysis where we actually figured out that at the speed of 21 knots, the gain in terms of fuel saving was about 25 tons per day, which led to a CO2 saving of 78.6 per day. So uh, with the data, with good data, you can actually assess and understand uh, the gains and the uh, payback of the retrofit actions. On the other hand, as we said, the optimization is uh, a core of the system and it's very important in order to even improve, it's possible, the efficiency over time and to maintain it. So for example, an optimum trim module that can handle CFD calculations or C trials is important to give to the crew a continual advice on how to operate the ship in the most efficient way in terms of trim. As RENA, we've also been focusing on how to understand the improvement of efficiency. So how can an owner understand how to improve the efficiency of the ship and meet the target. So we have some important questions that actually may come out, which are, shall the ship reduce the speed? Shall the ship be more loaded, for example, to improve the EOI? Uh, is the ship, this specific ship, going to meet the energy efficiency targets on a specific trade, or shall I deploy a different ship on this trade? So we've been 
focusing on these questions. And as, as a result, we have a, a simulator, a simulation mode based on, of course, uh, the core is on uh, the ship models of the ship that can be based on artificial intelligence or on white boxes or black boxes. Then we have the plan section where it's possible to plan the voyage with the specific ship, the departure and arrival port, daytime and so on, and then optimize different measures. So optimize the fuel consumption uh, or the sail distance or the UI or the CAI. So this can give significant advices on how to improve the uh, CII and the UI and to meet the new regulations. So, of course, the main pillars of a voyage optimization module, it's the root optimization algorithm, the ship response modeling, and the forecast weather models. So, from the um, ship hydrodynamic models point of view, we can have different techniques. So, we can have a white box model, which is based on physical model and ship design data. And of course, it takes into account the loading conditions for the ship, for example, or the weather effects. Then we can have the black box model, which is completely based on the recorded information and on machine learning techniques, which is actually as accurate as the data given to the model to be trained. In between, we have a gray box model, which puts together the um, good parts of the white model, of the white box, and of the black box. So we have the accuracy of the black box model, but the robustness, on the other hand, and control of the physical model. Uh, regarding the weather forecast, of course, it's important to have updated weather forecast in order to recalculate the road if, if needed. So we take into consideration the wind speed and direction, the global primary waves, and the combined currents with different frequencies. So the wind is actually updated four times per day, while the wave and the currents are updated once per day. The system, as uh, we were saying previously, gives the opportunity to apply constraints and to optimize and minimize different target measures. So from the constraints point of view, we can set up constraints on ETA or minimum remaining on board at arrival. Um, extreme weather conditions to be avoided, maximum power, uh, possible speed and RPM ranges, and so on. While on the other hand, we can optimize based on the shorter route, uh, or minimize the fuel consumption or CII UI, or minimize also the cost. So, for example, here we can see that the second uh, route that has been found is actually with the higher distance, but with lower consumption. And this leads, of course, to an optimized CII. So what I'm showing here is a result of a simulation. This, in this particular case, we actually had a 2.4% uh, of gain. So this is real gain. And the system is actually capable also of considering uh, the fuel cost, so based on ECA or not ECA path, and of course, taking into consideration also scrubber in case the ship has it, so the cost of the fuel will not change. So what we are actually trying to do with such digital system is to build a virtuous cycle. So having the opportunity to collect, monitor, analyze the data on the shore side, at first will increase the awareness about the ship energy efficiency and the emissions. Once we have the awareness of what's happening on the fleet with real data, with real good collected data, we actually have a possibility to monitor the evolution of EOI and CII over time and act in case of need. We therefore can maintain the efficiency of the ship over time as a, a target and we can optimize and even more reduce the carbon footprint of our ship. So with this, um, with this period of time, this period of time, of course, the improving the energy efficiency of the ships and optimize the operations of the ship will play a key role 
in allowing the maritime sector to meet the targets that have been set up by, by Marco. By Emil, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you very much, uh, Michaela, for a very comprehensive uh, presentation. And uh, uh, we'll take some of the questions at the end. I've seen some coming in about certificates, so maybe you can answer that uh, at the final session. And we can uh, move on to our next uh, presenter, uh, which is Mr. Tor Oyvin Ask from uh, Solvang ASA, who will be talking about vessel performance monitoring, the key to green shipping. Uh, Mr. Ask uh, started his deep sea career uh, in 1978 and has 24 years hands-on experience in technical maritime vessel operations. He holds an MSc in shipping and ship engines and a PhD in gas engines from the Norwegian Technical University. Since 1998, Mr. Ask has been working in various positions, heading the technical maritime and new building program in various shipping companies. And his current position is Fleet Director at Solvang, which has had an ongoing new building program since Mr. Ask took the position in 2006. So over to you, uh, Mr. Ask, the panel is, uh, the, the floor is yours. If you can uh, just unmute your microphone. <laughs> uh, thank you. Uh, do you see my screen and hear me? Yeah, perfect. Okay, thank you for your introduction. Uh, I talk a little bit about Solvang first and, and what we have done and how we work with this. And just to snap a picture from, from 2020 uh, annual report, and we at the moment we have 27 vessels with a little bit more than 1 million ton of dead weight. It's eight very large gas carriers, nine large gas carriers, one mid size, and nine uh, semi-ref uh, vessel, which is uh, the land vessel. So all of them is gas carried. Last year, we burned 250 tons of uh, fuel, used 1.6 million ton liters of fuel oil, released 785,000 tons of CO2, SOX a little bit more than ton, uh, thousand ton, and NOx six, a little bit more than 6,000 ton. That we did by running main engine, 159,000 hours. Oxley engines, 352,000 running hour and, and uh, boilers, 32,000 hour. And of course, there is where we have the consumption. Solvang has the history back from 1936. And uh, it's from 1936 to 1989, it was an investment company with we, we this different uh, it have some offshore it have some some uh, rigs and but in, two, in 1989 the owner which is today owner or his uh, their grandfather took over the company and they started to transform into a modern company and in 2006 there was a large big uh, large scale new building with 10 new building delivered in 2007 and 8 2006 to 2011, we're starting to, to really go into the operation of the vessel. And we see when we're starting to monitor that the vessel was the perform not at all close to the sea form of what we expect. So what is the problem? And we find we need a, a vessel performance monitoring system and we need reliable data to see what's actually going on. In 2011, we started also a program we called how to turn our blue logo green, and, and we looked up what we should we do when we're going into new building. Since that, we have ordered and get a lot of new vessel, which is designed after this eco LPG carrier concept. And we also know we are in 2020, and we have also tried to where we will be in 2050. So this is uh, where we hope to be. What's green shipping? It's a lot about green shipping, uh, and but it's, the definition is not so uh, straightforward. And what we see is offshore, short sea, deep sea, totally different operation requirements and solution. So, so we, and you can say with short sea to compare to deep sea, that's it, that's another world. And the solution for short sea it cannot be scaled. 
So we have tried to make a definition for uh, of ourselves to work against. And we say that green, ship is, green shipping is constantly to evolve greener. And then we're talking about hull lines, uh, propeller speed, main engine, uh, heat recovery, and we use whatever trick we have, including operational procedures to, uh, to, to uh, try to reduce fuel consumption because basically it's all about reducing fuel consumption. But how do we do our action are working? That we, <laughs> we need a high quality vessel performance monitoring system. And the one I will talk about now is, uh, is based on, on the noon reports, but we also have automatic data from the, from coming from our, some of our vessel and we used it, but this one is based on, on noon report. But first also I say deep sea green uh, vessel operation and construction, because it's about establishing best uh, practices for our vessel, which is in operation. And then we talk on maintenance of equipment, running of equipment, optimal trim, road planning, planning of cargo ballast operation, hull condition, plus, plus, plus. So that's all the thing we do uh, on board. No, it's uh, another presentation popping up. Or I, in my screen, see Arthur's Seaman Energy. Yeah, something's happened, uh, Thor. Um, Perhaps uh, Elnara can help out here. There's something happened with the, the slides. I cannot. In the wrong ones. Back to my again. No, okay. I've, I've done nothing. Sorry. <laughs> thank Sorry, you. Thank you. I've done yeah. nothing. Uh, uh, okay. Thank you. So, so basically, and then we're going back to green design and a fuel efficient design on vessels. So you actually need to, to make the vessel technically as fuel efficient as possible by engine tail technology, type of fuel, exhaust, after treatment, uh, equipment on board, hull line, cargo capacity, and all the other things. So you need to build a vessel as good as possible, then you need to run it as good as possible. And both of those are, of course, very important. And we see a lot of this picture, oh, we need to change fuel, there is something dramatically wrong. But this, though this vessel have a fuel problem, I'm almost 100% sure I have nothing to do with the uh, fuel. Environmental footprint are given from the interaction between the fuel and engine technology. And uh, engine type, working principle, operation load, maintenance, of course, and after treatment uh, of exhaust and other discharges is the key thing. And, and, uh, and uh, it doesn't, the fuel is just a small part of it. Of course, when you're talking about decarbonization, CO2 is another story, but for the our harmful emission to the air, it's, it's the total setup which is important. We started in 2008 with an in-house system based on uh, daily recording, but monthly uh, to our office. And we recorded all possible data which running our on, on our equipment, uh, for example, running on our own main engines, uh, uh, Stroke, cylinder oil consumption, actually running our uh, OFO consumption on the different equipment, and all this uh, thing we can take in directly out of this. This is where we are now. This is a snapshot on, of our operation. So you see, we are in a way all over the world. So no, it's not. Uh, we have a system which is uh, automatically also a noon report system. So all the data is going up to the is coming into the office automatically, and we get a little information out of this as as uh, fuel consumption per day and and some of it. But when we go to really go from from measurement to KPIs, we use uh, uh, Power BI or another system because this, this uh, automatic system for taking in the data is not capable. And we, we're doing a lot of calculation on the, uh, some of them monthly, some of them yearly, and we, we try to get all the information which is possible out of this. But then the main question, what do you do with information? How can you share it? And how can you get something useful of it? And again, we have a lot of system, but one, very important tool is our monthly fleet feedback report. That's a monthly report 
which we summarized the performance, the last, now the Siemens uh, is popping in again, uh, where we summarize uh, the vessel, uh, the speed uh, consumption curves. We have uh, the performance and consumption on our axle engines, boilers uh, for cargo handling and all this. And we have, so, so this is a report on about 40 pages, which is monthly sent to the vessel and they should use in their monthly meetings. They have, uh, we have a system where we have uh, for training people and 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 uh, get the, the information out. We have four uh, weekly meetings in uh, every month, and we every year make a plan for focus area. So, but every month they have number uh, the the me uh, meeting number three is going through the report with the performance of the vessel and how do they doing regard uh, related to the performance indicator we have set. And, uh, and but two months, we every year we go into more into details on the environmental side and fuel consumption, and and uh, go use the whole month, all the four meetings on a subject like uh, on, on the environmental side. We go as I said, we uh, how to turn our green uh, now blue vessel green. We go is we decided in two thousand and ten how should we really optimize our vessel when we get new building, because we see that when you go into a yard, you get uh, in a way cheapest uh, vessel they, they can offer. And how can, what can we do with that? And we basically go and say, we, okay, what can, how can we save fuel and what will it cost? And we do the, the calculation and see what we should invest additional in our vessel. And typically we, it's a, three, four million dollar extra we put into a standard vessel to fuel optimize and and uh, to 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 make this better. And we clearly state the question is not which fuel you use, but how you use it in the whole setup. That is the main thing. And it's really simple. Where do we use the fuel? And where is the losses? And how can we improve? Exhaust with heat recovery, propeller with Nevis duct, with, uh, with hull design, uh, and all the going into all system, how can we improve? That end up in a set of additional thing we put in. We we never stacked integrated rudder, hull lines, cargo capacity. We use uh, use scrubbers and on all the last uh, new building we have for NOx. We have a low pressure EGR or SCR heat recovery on actually engine high quality anti fouling system, which is an uh, extremely important. We have gone from vessel performance to ship performance system, cargo system, and et cetera, et cetera. Putting in all the uh, bits and pieces we can do for optimization of and reducing the fuel consumption. What have we achieved? Yes, and I, I think we, we are quite proud of what we have achieved because we, we see that this is really working. In, we have uh, used the vessel performance monitoring system we developed and putting up the figures, the history from 2009 to 2020. And in this case, figures we're looking at RAR, annual efficiency ratio, and EEOI. We see for our fleet, the, whole, the, the e RAR have been improved by 37% little bit different between the different vessels, but this is our fleet in 2009. Uh, and and this is our ethylene fleet in 2020, going from 22.8 to 14.6. And all the vessel class have reduced in this period. The EUI is another way to see this there. We have a, for the whole fleet is improved even more because we have, uh, this is the, the, the cargo capacity and it's a little bit different way to look at it. But it's a, it's a huge improvement. And also in 2009, which is our reference year, 10 of our vessel was new building and all the other have been dry docked the year before. So this is, this is really a, a huge improvement, but a, a lot of it is from the anti-falling we are using, sandblasting and all this, uh, technical thing we are doing. Another way to look at this is just interesting, but 
In 2009, we have an average cargo capacity on 40.4, 40, 46,000 uh, tonne. In 2020, this have increased to 51,000 tonne. The dead weight had increased from 32,000 tonne to 37,000 tonne. And at the same time, kilogram fuel per nautical mile siled have gone down from about 130 uh, kilo per nautical mile to 105 nautical uh, kilogram per nautical mile. From the different, this is uh, an example on the ethylene vessel, which is a special class we have. And this was vessel built in 1978. This is vessel built in 1998, uh, 99, and we have vessel built in 2007 and eight and 2019. And uh, the fuel reduction is 60% in fuel going on uh, looking at this year, more than 40, 60%. Looking at the NOx, it's an MTL3 operation. You see the reduction is 90, 95%. The particle is the same, and SOx is almost gone on those vessels which is running when we run in unscrub. So, but all this is based on we need to measure, we need to quantify, and we need to document the effect of the different action we are taking. So, a conclusion. Without a high quality vessel performance monitoring, it's not possible to document. And therefore, again, as the title of my speaker is, we, we need to have reliable data so we can document and prove that action and investment we are doing is working. Thank you. That was uh, what I um, uh, was planning to to. Uh, uh, show you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Toro Wind, and uh, I think very interesting uh, and insightful presentation. Uh, looking at what your company has done, and uh, congratulations to you for all, all your very good efforts in looking at this whole performance management uh, and monitoring uh, equation. I think. Uh, Mark is still having technical problems, uh, which we cannot solve even with our technology. Um, and that's unfortunate, he sends his apologies, but in any case, uh, we can continue with our Q&A sessions. Uh, there are, I think, plenty of uh, questions that have come in uh, for all the, the panelists. Some uh, our panelists have been really great at answering uh, in, in, in written form, but I think there are some which we can perhaps uh, open up for a, maybe a wider discussion because they are, they are quite interesting and some good questions. Uh, I think the one which uh, immediately strikes me is a question from Thomas Whitlin and essentially uh, this is focusing on the whole uh, the whole fouling discussion which uh, is that one which is, uh, I would say, timeless <laughs> in, in shipping, uh, irrespective of whether we've had uh, more automation or, or, or less uh, in the past. But I think one of the key issues here is, uh, and I think uh, Ossi at the beginning, he touched upon it in, in his presentation and also he's provided an answer, um, looking at the different KPIs that we have and in fact what, let's say, IMO has come up with, uh, EDI, EEXI now for existing ships, uh, they don't really address, uh, let's say, the, the hard and fast uh, measurement of what is, let's say, the, the condition of the hull, how does that affect uh, the whole the hull resistance, uh, and then by default also the, uh, the fuel consumption. And that in, it, in itself is a, is, a, is a different set of KPIs. Uh, so my question is, and I will open up to, to all the panelists is what can actually be done? What would you suggest uh, are the best measures for, for a, let's say a ship operator to, to apply? And then what kind of, uh, let's say, solutions are available? I don't know who wants to start. Maybe Ossi, because you, you answered already the question. Uh, maybe yes, you can expand so, a bit more on that uh, on, on a live basis. Yes, so I already, discussed about this with Thomas on the chat side. Uh, anyway, the, 
and also included in my presentation list is like scaling these parameters, like defining the hull fouling for vessel to vessel and making like fair comparable KPIs to measure actually what is the impact of the hull fouling, what is the impact of the weather and all that it is very challenging task to do and because they're just the amount of parameters there are is so vast and the one thing that is also coming here is that the um, i hope that the upcoming carbon intensity indicator cii is helping us helping the industry here a bit because um even though currently the condition of the hull in a time chartered world is um a problem for the charter because they are as well paying for the fuel but the owner's con concern is mostly about whether the vessel meets the meets her warrant performance warranties or not but with cii i hope that it will in it will encourage ship owners to look into the solutions you know turning all these possible stones to find the most fuel efficient and alternatives for their fleet and technologies so that so that charterers and the whole industry actually will benefit from these solutions and, and there is in that when it comes to that the all parties involved in the industry are play a role here because it is important that the let's say the financial institutes or interest givers givers or port authorities shipping pools they all start to require more energy efficient vessels to operate and this will CII will help help on that and reducing the hull fouling and keeping the hull in, in good order is helping on that. Uh, sorry, um, my mic was muted. But yes, thank you for that, Ozzy. And uh, yeah, I think also the point here is that I think irrespective of who pays uh, for the fuel, whether it's the, the charter or the or the owner, I think every owner uh, will have the incentive. To, to reduce consumption uh, or make his or her, let's say, vessel more employable, uh, but also, you know, will have more operational efficiency in general. So uh, I think the key issue here, maybe Tor would like to say something in terms of uh, his experience with, with, within Solvent, uh, how you can actually uh, come up with a set of KPIs which are reliable, which are repeatable, which are consistent, and can be benchmarking, let's say, this very important aspect of how fouling across a vessel's fleet, a fleet, a fleet of vessels, sorry. Thank you. I think the, it, it's, um, for us, we see that this noon reporting system uh, is, is very good because it's, a, as we have been seeing now, that the data is varying a lot. This, you, you, you need a number of days and, and, and uh, maybe in a month you maybe get only one day with uh, less than both or five. So you haven't data. So what we have chosen to do is actually we take uh, everything in and, and see where we are and, or, and compare it with the baseline and this we have no. We also utilizing something we call as performance speed, which is which is a additional fee in, in the system we are using. But that many times overestimate the effect of the weather. So there is uh, what we end up is that we using a lot of performance speed and we using uh, all weather uh, <laughs> the performance and we need to see it after a day, a month or two, if a vessel drifting off. But with this approach, we see very clearly one month, two months, and something is going on. Okay, uh, we need to go for propeller polishing or something like that. But it starts really with with uh, empty folding. And what we see in 2008 and nine that uh, the empty folding was really a disaster. <laughs> we talk about five years, uh, and we go into it very close cooperation with two makers and see give us the best you have and we putting on and you don't you don't need a warranty because if it doesn't perform we see it <laughs> and you you need to go and after that the the, the the first one in 2013 we maybe end up going two three years with a good performance and we analyze that again and now we are see we are more in year three and it's still okay so i think it's a you really need to go into a high quality uh, anti-folding so because if not you have lost anyhow and 
in our trade, going for hull cleaning and all this is a hassle. It's a, it's, it's a very difficult, it's easy when you say it, but in a practical operation, we know the performance is off, but it's very difficult to get the chance to to do anything. So, uh, and uh, and when you look at IR and EOI and all this, I'm, a lot of it is due to this new anti-fouling and then we see it's drifting off, go to propeller polishing at once and taking action and, and when we see something is, is drifting out. So it starts again with, with reliable data, but I think it's this is not high frequent data you need. You need data which <laughs> actually average out. And if there is a question, we also go into looking at data, days with very nice weather and take a single shot and see if this tell us something. And, and we see on the slip on the propeller and use all the thing which is uh, available. But when we are looking on our own analysis compared to the analysis from the uh, the, the makers of, uh, of antifolding, we see that we actually detected before. So it is possible, but you need to 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 have a, uh, the amount of data, <laughs> and you need to to analyze and see where you normally are uh, with those vessels. And, and, and the shock was in 2008, 9, 10. Why? It, what is wrong? Because you have data from the the yards and they promising speed consumption uh, data and the vessel was not even close and that was after <laughs> six months a year and and but we now understand it and see well, uh, what's what's uh, how this is working and, and uh, yeah again you need to have data i don't it is more that they are accurate they don't need to be yeah, daily data aggregated to month for us that works perfect and we, after a couple of months or two, we, we, we see it. It's, it's not something which is changing fast. Uh, it's, uh, we have done looked at that also, but uh, this is not changing fast. It's weather is changing fast, and, but not the, 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 the vessel itself. Okay, thank you. I mean, that, that's very, very uh, interesting. Um, I think, yeah, the answer is to have this continuous, uh, let's say, feed of data, uh, which is obviously uh, check the quality and reliability uh, but I agree with you I mean, it's uh, if you get to the stage of needing the whole cleaning it's not always possible it has a big cost uh, but also the, the facilities are not always available uh, when you want them so it's uh, something which uh, ultimately uh, you need to look at your system uh, anti found paints etc cetera, etc cetera, and make sure and it's it's a, it's a good one um, Okay, let's move on. Uh, I'm trying to see the next question. There was one which came in about certification. I don't know whether that uh, is maybe for Michaela, uh, where Dean Dan really, is saying is there flexibility in any certification uh, for postponing dry docking based on data? Uh, yeah, so, we have uh, a few actually. Uh, we are working or something like this, but of course, as a classification society, we cannot decide these things on our own. Uh, of course, we are IF members, so uh, we have an environment <laughs> behind us and uh, above us. So, uh, yes, we we are talking about something like this, so using data to uh, change uh, and work on the way we do the surveys and so on, just like we did with the, the remote surveys. For example, that Rina is doing with the success, but I cannot say nothing about it at the moment. And actually, also because I'm more on the advisory part rather than on the class-related topics. Yeah, I mean, I, I would I would say just in general terms. Uh, I mean, obviously, this is a, at the moment e, EXI is a simple pass/fail. Uh, um, so I think okay, companies will need to do their homework. Do their calculations and see where they are in terms of the actual versus the target uh, and do this well in advance of their survey dates and make sure that if there are let's say any corrective actions to be taken they do them at the right time if, if a dry docking is involved uh, then that will be done at that time uh, i don't see personally uh, any extension being given for any other let's say reason apart from any let's say exceptional circumstances as they are given at the moment. Uh, so 
I think that's probably uh, enough on that issue. Um, there's one uh, question which I know, Ossi, again, you've answered, uh, but it's looking at the, you know, what is the speed reduction uh, or main engine load reduction necessary to attain best fuel consumption and avoid? And maybe we can open this up. Uh, I don't know whether, Patrick, you have a view uh, based on, uh, I think, your, on your analysis with the container ships. Uh, have you got any, let's say, benchmark figures to, to give to uh, to the audience? Uh, yes, uh, as I answered in the chat, uh, uh, so the, um, for the, especially for the auxiliary engine optimization, what is a pure small field of optimization, uh, we reach uh, above uh, 3% uh, over one year. So uh, you can calculate by yourself what this, this in, in uh, dollars is meaning. Uh, it's amazing. And if you, we can use the same algorithm to, to, uh, to transport them to, to a main engine and uh, uh, show there the, the efficiency legs and uh, that the crew or the operator can can uh, change the behavior or repair the, the the dedicated part of the vessel or change the setting of uh, of the main engine and if you imagine that there is also three percent theoretical possible then you are saving really dollars and co2 mm -hmm. after a little bit a little bit the answer of your question yeah, I mean, it's looking at the saving. Uh, I think also the when you're looking at the one option is, is obviously the the slow steaming and, and uh, reducing speed. So I don't know whether you have any view on that in terms of absolute or, or percentage. Terms. Sure. Yeah. I had to talk about uh, uh, percentage, which kind of solution delivers, which kind of percentage uh, in the saving yeah. area. It's always I, I got a lot of similar questions from 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 customers from clients uh, uh, during negotiation. I I find this is not a serious answer that I say okay this is saving that this is saving that. Uh, this is uh, uh, always individual from vessel to vessel. My statement is in each vessel I guess we found at least a couple of percentage of fuel saving. In which area this is always different. I think uh, uh, on Solvik uh, uh, vessels it will be hard to find uh, uh, real the low-hanging fruits because uh, uh, what Tor is uh, explaining to us, they are already uh, uh, working on saving fuel, per, uh, increasing the performance, get knowledge about their hull get transparency, what is the situation on the vessel, so the low-hanging fruits are there I guess already gone, but I think there will be still a, a place for improvements. What I like on the history solution is uh, uh, and the statement: transparency is everything in, in in this area, and that's the first key success factor which uh, digitization delivers us. Get the transparency: what is the behavior of your vessel? Make all data comparable. Don't use your crew to run around and uh, uh, write down figures, uh, which they take a half hour uh, by walking through your engine room and then put it into a, a Excel sheet and then try to make any performance calculations. That's, that's not the right way uh, because then you are, your data is not comparable because you have not the same timestamp, uh, uh, it's not uh, uh, they have no relationship to each other and therefore consistent data and then think about okay if you have that analyze them and see uh, where your your lack of, of efficiency is good and thank, you, thank you Patrick that's a good point on transparency yeah, yeah. okay uh, another question uh, generally which can just come in I don't know whether anyone on the panel has any direct experience but it's looking at wind assisted propulsion so uh, the question is whether we have any solutions uh, to help determine which are the savings which are related from any wind assisted propulsion, uh, or would you have to derive this from a baseline data set prior to any uh, wind assisted propulsion being put on board? 
I don't know who can answer this. I can take on that. Uh, so the well, my personal experience passes from from the platinum rotors, one form of of wind assistant propulsion in a sense. And um, well, in a short, the answer is quite similar to what Patrick just gave us. It is a very case specific and also very much the route specific. So there is no one easy answer for the same importance and all that. But in general, if you we are talking about deep sea operation cross Atlantic across Pacific, the saving potential is quite significant on those operations. And there are already uh, good public studies and references available from, I, think, I guess, what Maersk uh, Pelikan was one of the examples. Uh, uh, the We're talking about like above 10% fuel savings possibilities in overall, not only on the on the good windy days, but in overall. And it's, um, I think that being one of the very, viable solution in the future, but it is not a solution for all vessels. So for example, coming from Finland and, and Baltic Sea area, the the operation around here may not be the prime candidate for this. But when we call for deep sea operation, yes, I would, when considering new builds, when considering retrofitting, when considering meeting the EXI requirements, the wind propulsion is something that I would suggest the ship owners to consider. Yeah, and uh, for sure it's something we're seeing more and more take up, uh, especially on, on, on new buildings, but also retrofitting. So uh, I guess it is something that we need to monitor and see exactly you know, how much saving they can uh, actually help uh, achieve. And to add on that, the um, uh, we at Napa, we have done actually quite a lot of studies for clients to ask, okay, what is the, uh, in my vessel, what is the fuel saving potential for last, let's say 24 months in, the, in her vessel's operation, knowing the location and the wind conditions and all that. So we can do retrospective analysis on that too. So it doesn't have to be only like guesswork from manufacturer, it can be also studied. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Questions coming for uh, Solvang, for uh, Mr. Ask, apart from thanking him for the great presentation. Uh, apart from the paint uh, application and considering all the different technologies that you installed, were you personally positively surprised about uh, their impact? I don't know whether I understand the question. Could you please repeat? Mm. I think uh, what, what uh, the aim of the question is uh, you're considering all the different technologies that you have put uh, onto your vessels and, and different installations uh, and the good results that you achieved. Were you positively surprised or was it something that you were expecting uh, before uh, or when you planned it? Let's say? Uh, it's, no or yes. We, we hoped that it was based on calculation and based on what we see. Uh, when we we do did the first one, so so actually it's a, it's a, uh, no it was it was in a way uh, proof of proof of <laughs> that technology working when you do it right then and and uh, and, uh, and uh, the first time we really was surprised with the near mistake then we see that actually slip on the propeller was positive. <laughs> actually, then we see this is not bullshit. This this is actually, <laughs> and and uh, and uh, so the calculation uh, we did up front was uh, quite okay. And when we did the last uh, last uh, air class, now when we did the calculation, what we expect, and we see we end up quite close to that. So so it's uh, actually it's a uh, but there's not some 10, 20, 30, 40 percent. It's a uh, cup three, four, five there, two there. <laughs> Or something there, but uh, when you add it up, it, it's considerable. But I think in the the main thing uh, negative have been how bad the actual anti foldings perform before, <laughs> because when we taking out new vessel and after five uh, year we dry dock them and the actually vessel become ten percent maybe better fuel consumption than it was when it was new. <laughs> so so actually. And that was not bad anti-foilings we put on, but actually the whole, it was not 
better than that. So I think when you change from this, go from this new one with uh, with out any tin and and uh, and there was there was a lot of disaster which is was not working and uh, and uh, so I think the biggest is actually you need to keep the hull and propeller good if not you have lost and you don't talk about two two three percent you're talking about 10 15 20 percent the dr- increase in fuel consumption or drop in speed so 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 the single most important parameter is actually keep your hull uh, good if not you have lost and when it starts it will not stop so, <laughs> stop so you need to and as i think it's a then be falling and of course you can be in places where you are have high pressure on marine growth and then you can do a nice hull, hull uh, uh, just sweep and get off that and be back again but, but it is it is really uh yeah, this is really the most important thing, I think, because when they're starting to fail, it's not fail a little, it fail, it really gives you dramatic increase in, 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 in fuel consumption or, or lost, loss in speed. Yes, I agree, I agree. And uh, this is also a related question from uh, Gerald Victor saying whether you've differentiated between hydro hull cleaning and traditional brush hull cleaning. Yeah. Uh, the traditional brush is a disaster <laughs> so that is it's uh that is you really need to try to avoid that because then you you real problem you you, you you just you just last for a month or two and then it's even worse than it was so so i think it's your need to have have uh, have but what we have seen and it's a big problem is that how to how much antifoam do you apply how do they calculate because there's a big fight uh, use as little anti-folding as possible and that is when you quote then they say okay after three years you run out of anti-folding <laughs> oh it's not over before because the temperature have been three four five degrees higher where you sail than when we do the calculation but it's so now we are in a way we have some some uh, company we, we we deal with and we this is your we say we want the best solution you can offer and you should not cheat with the thickness because when we run out and after three years and we have that we have a lot of examples on that uh, it performs well in three years and then it's uh, on, uh, gone and then you are in big trouble so so we uh, you need to in a way nail them the the the, the people <laughs> the anti folding maker and and they need to be a part of it and they are responsible when it's not working in the way they uh, promise mm-hmm. Good, good. Thank you. Thank you, Tor. Um, another question is, have any of you seen efforts to use wave measurement radar detection in order to get a better calculation of any added resistance from waves and movement of the ship and possibly have a better fit to propeller curves? Any takers? So answer, simple answer is no on that one i make it unmute no <laughs> but i, I see all of us are not <laughs> are shaking the no. heads not if you're going into this you really need a lot of information not yeah it's special it's very special uh, uh, yeah, so, so, so i think it's a uh, you need to find a level which is okay for your purpose and we had a question on uh, trim optimization which i see you've, you've answered uh, Ossi and, and Michaela. So I think, unless anyone else wants to say anything on trim optimization, uh, then at all, have you had any experience? Yeah, we, we uh, actually on all new vessels, we do, do make curves for, for optimal trim regarding on the different load condition because we get a, quite a big shock here <laughs> on the first vessel we uh, ordered in uh, this design. and. 2000 and delivering 2013 because uh, half loaded with wrong design had much higher fuel consumption than uh, fully loaded or ballast. <laughs> so mm-hmm. so uh, it's then the bulk was really uh, wrong. So now we know what we are doing, but it's uh, it's critical with the new design because in some trims it can even be uh, you don't expect it, but it even worse than than fully loaded or fully ballast. But wrong wrong trim on, on a half load can be a disaster so so we have the trim curves and we're telling the vessel how to 
trim it, but sometimes it's not possible because of where you have the cargo is the different tanks and segregation and all this. But it's uh, it's just really something to be aware of when you 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 have you running the vessel because it can you can get surprises. May I add here? Uh, for me, uh, uh, trim optimization is, is also a very good example uh, to make things uh, in the wrong direction. Uh, for sure, uh, there is a lot of software available to optimize the trim up to now. And then you're sailing with your vessel, uh, you're burning fuel, um, etc. And after a while, your, your trim situation is completely changed off the vessel. So if you would like to get the best out of uh, uh, out of your trim, you have to investigate it constantly uh, over your whole trip. And then what always is forgotten, a trim is nothing which has happened for free. You're also using energy to trim your vessel into your right direction. So if you are on the best ever trim uh, for your whole uh, 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 trip, for your whole voyage, and use more energy to trim always the vessel into the right uh, 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 position, uh, then you can save, uh, and then you, in the end of the day have yeah the golden medal in trimming, but uh, not in uh, saving uh, fuel. I think yeah. Tor uh, is fully agree for his experience, right? Yeah. You are muted. I think the main uh, thing is to try to be close to the optimum point regarding the speed and draft you have. And there you will change a little bit. The curve is also quite flat in that area. So I think it's more about awareness of where you should not be. And, and because this is not exact scientific, so, so it's uh, to be close to the point and then we say it's, it's, uh, it's okay. Uh, and, and because it's, it, it's yeah, you don't <laughs> you're just wasting energy to, to, to if you try to, to stay on the, 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 the nail there. Yeah, yeah, but I see solutions for that from other, not not here in this premium available people or companies. Okay, uh, just one more question, which has come now at the end. Uh, maybe Michaela can answer this one. Uh, if you have any opinion, uh, looking at your, let's say, analysis on any of the vessels you've done so far, uh, looking at EEXI limits, uh, have you seen any, uh, let's say, benchmarks on, on speed reduction amounts coming out from the, the calculations? And is there anything specific that you can suggest? Actually, I'm, I'm afraid to say I'm, I'm not the one doing the EEXI calculations at the moment. So uh, I don't have a, an answer to, to this. Okay, maybe it's one we, we can take offline and maybe uh, Yeah, respond. of course, I can have the colleagues uh, reply directly on it. It would be good. Uh, also, I think for, the, for everyone to understand, you know, what is the, let's say, the, the first calculations coming out. Uh, if, we, if you are, let's say, limiting power as well, how much does that help? I think that would be useful. Yeah, usually the colleagues are actually talking about engine power limitations as a first okay. step. Okay, uh, no worries. And maybe just one more, maybe we haven't touched on. I'm not sure I understand it fully, but let's see. How about the optimizing electric propeller system or the electrical system of energy efficiency? Any takers for that? Uh, may I can say something? If I understand the question correct, I think for, for deep sea vessel, with a with a big two stroke directly driven propel, you can you have no chance to compete with if you introduce a generator and then a new electromotor and that. But of course, on a cruise vessel or a vessel with with a, which have a lot of uh, capacity or electrical, it's a totally different. But but when you you're looking at the efficiency of this two stroke concept, it's more than fifty percent efficiency on the propeller. You, you, then you also go often go to a four stroke and that have a high lower efficiency uh, from the beginning and then to a generator and then to uh, the, you, you, you can never win that game <laughs> compared to the two stroke uh, concept, I think. I fully agree. Uh, 
I disagree a little bit uh, if we are thinking uh, into the future and if we are thinking we would like to drive our vessel carbon neutral, we definitely would not drive them with a two-stroke engine. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> so, and the, 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 the rotation to the water will be electric. However, the energy will be produced on board on the vessel, but the motor will be definitely electric. In my perspective. Mm. Interesting. Good. So, electrical okay. propulsion should be the future. And I'm Perhaps. working for an electrical company, so sorry. Perhaps. We are delivering electrical propulsion systems. Yeah. <laughs> you need but there are also solutions coming. There are also solutions coming for uh, two-stroke engine for ammonia, for example, yeah. which can be carbon neutral for that. So it is not that black and white, but it's always should be considered. Case by case and operation wise, so but definitely shorter sea uh, passenger vessels, the diesel electric propulsion line makes sense, but there, we're still a long way from challenging the efficiency of two stroke engines, as Torres just said. Absolutely, Ozzy, that's something which came up yesterday as well in the module on uh, energy efficiency, and I think everyone agreed that you know going forwards, it's not going to be a one size fits all solution. They're going to be different, let's say, uh, propulsion uh, configurations and, and fuels, in, in fact. Um, and it will depend on the trade. It will depend on the on the, on the uh, operating profile and the type of vessel uh, to see which, uh, in the end, technology will be applied. Uh, so let's wait and see. Uh, but I think it's going to be a potpourri at the end, not one single solution. That's definitely. Well, the good thing is on the electric propulsion system, so if you are changing from AC uh, uh, to, to uh, DC current, is that you are also uh, have the possibility to add uh, uh, the new uh, energy sources like fuel cells, uh, solar cells, um, etc. to your to your power grid. Uh, and uh, you can make as well there in, in good uh, uh, energy source uh, uh, Mm -hmm. Okay, so I think we've probably reached the end of uh, our uh, time period and I think we've addressed the majority of the questions either in written or uh, verbal form. So, you know, for me, just in terms of uh, conclusions, I think we've seen already uh, a number of examples where digitalization has already been introduced in our industry and as we've seen uh, has brought clear benefits um, but I think this process let's say we can call it a process of digitalization is, is or should be focused on uh, a number of stepping stones uh, in order to look at the transition uh, in a smooth manner uh, as opposed to a complete revolution so I think trying to find integrated solutions uh, is going to be key uh, and then, of course, implementation is absolutely important. So we've heard about some uses of data analytics uh, in ship management, uh, which have been centered around the concept of applying uh, these data analytic methods to vessels, AIS, weather databases, etc., in order to optimize vessel com commercial performance. And they can also include the application of predictive uh, data analytic methods to vessel data in order to predict optimal maintenance times, to achieve longer maybe equipment life cycles, lower maintenance and replacement costs. So the use of performance monitoring and condition-based maintenance tools to reduce costs, eliminate breakdowns and find efficiencies was also addressed. However, navigating the future just can't be done alone. We have to look at digitalization uh, in terms of changing the framework uh, of our traditional maritime business, but it's got to be built around collaboration, trust, transparency that we mentioned uh, today, and of course, uh, data quality and security. But most importantly, I think it's going to rely on our people in the industry in order to accept and adopt the change in practice for which we all need to work together to achieve. Thank you to all of you for being here today, the audience for being really good, interacting and, and posing some uh, very interesting questions. Many thanks and congratulations to all the panel of experts uh, for your excellent presentations and, and answers. 
And once more, thanks to the sponsors, uh, which we mentioned at the beginning, Napa, Siemens Marine Energy, Rena, and of course to the BS Group uh, for organizing this event. So from me, thank you very much and, and goodbye. Stay safe and hope we can renew our, let's say, e-meeting uh, in a future date. Have a good afternoon. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.